every day, all day. We used to dance 10 hours a day. If there was any room in here, you, you heard people tapping every minute. It was always a challenge. Each one would show the different new steps that they've learned. It was really, really exciting, and it is. Once people learn to tap and they hear their rhythm, you know, it's like playing an instrument. You really enjoy it, you know? And what I try to do, I, I, I've never let it stop. I'm the only teacher in New York, or maybe one or two others, maybe, that when it died, didn't stop, because I know what it did for me. So, the book is fine, oh! I pound my kids because I know as you've seen some of the kids there, they got feet like gold. They're as good as any tap dancer. They can dance well as I can or anyone else. But I trained them the way I was trained from my teacher who was supposed to be considered one of the greatest of all, Ernest Carlos. He, he taught everybody in the business. And uh, I just carrying the ball. Come on, keep it. Five, five, five. All right, we all know it. You do that in that Five, six, seven, go. Real art 
art is really lost. And when the old timers go, all those great, you know, puppets from the old days, it's going to be sad, I think, if someone doesn't try to keep it alive somehow. and the ballet. But America didn't have a damn thing in the culture in any way until we came along with that pal of our feet and gave the world that feeling with a rhythmic beat and presenting in a copacetic way the African dancers in that great rock band. Bring it on! So you kids are very fortunate today, it's like new. It's yeah. old then, 
but it's new now, and I appreciate you kids doing this for me. All right. Thanks a lot. Okay? All right. Yeah. All right, kids. Thanks a lot. Like this, when not people like you, hey, it could be people like us. All right, then. that's good. I appreciate that. All right? Yeah. Just keep dancing. sneak under the movies and the circus come. And we used to see the movies, we used to see those old dancers dancing there. This was what I got carried away with. Mm -hmm. So then I, I, I told my mother, let's go, I don't know, we, we, we can go. She said, well, Maceo, mm -hmm. I, I want to go to, to New York City where we can open the laundry because we got so good on ironing and washing clothes. Mm -hmm. So my mother said, we got on a boat, so we got a passage coming on a cotton boat. This is 1922, 1921, I should say. And this boat brought us around the butt way and into New York, we finally arrived. And then uh, when I got to New York, I heard about this has a club called the Hoofers Club, where dancers, Negro dancers, go on the Lafayette Theater, which is 132nd Street in South Avenue. And we used to go down there, and we would see various dancers. And one well-known man I can remember, his name was Bill Bojangles Robinson. And he was inspired of all Negro dancers, because he was the dancer, and he would do the dancing. Da, 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 da.
novels, of book and novels, which I heard about, but he wasn't as popular as uh, that. This was 1923 now. And, uh, well, we come down to see this Bubbles. And this Bubbles, he was great. He was just great. He was called Buck and Bubbles. The old team of Buck and Bubbles was a big hit. And then the Follies. Now, I'd like to show you how Bubbles danced. See, Bubbles do a rhythm. See, I dance in two different ways. I dance like the white fellas and the colored fellas, and I put them together. So when you saw me, you didn't know who you was looking at, only by my color. Because I was doing slides that the Negroes hadn't come out of then. I do four-way slides, you know, and back slides and forward slides. I was doing everything that the white fella did because I knew what to do and how to do it. I took my partner out of school when he was 13 years old. Who was your partner? Buck. 13 years old, I went and talked to the principal about his hands being able to play piano. He could never learn in school where he could, his hands could get him now because they have an opportunity to go to New York. And that was our first trip. In 1990, we went to New York, age 13 and 17. And we then looked back. Was it hard at that time for um, a well, was it hard? Was it hard? Well, I should say it was. We had to put on cork to work the theater we were in Kentucky. We had to put on cork. You understand that? No, what is that? Black paint on our faces to cover up so the audience wouldn't know we were colored. At the same time, J. Al Jones was putting on cork to keep him to know he was white. You see? And he was singing Mammy, Mammy, and I was singing Mammy or Mine. Can you imagine that? It was something else. It was something else. You couldn't get in nothing. And to get on the stage, my goodness, how can you get on the stage? This is like pulling hands to you to get on the stage. You had to be everything else but what you were in order to get on the stage. You had to be a porter, a boot black, or you had to be anything. And everything else would, that would be below par to get on the stage. Then you had to be twice as good to be recognized. Then four times as good to be put anywhere. We had to be offered superb. You know that. So look at us in the picture. Our talent surpassed their, uh, Dick Powell's talent. But we weren't the star of the film. But why did they, but they want us in there because we were entertainers. You understand? Janitors. With Dick, with, with uh, Danny Kay, as janitor. As janitor. World's great dancing, the world's good singer. Janitors. You understand that? Okay, now what can you do? What can you do? Cotton Club in 32. What was uh, the Cotton Club like in 32? What was Harlem like? It was beautiful. Father, it was what I can remember of it. Nina Holman, in the course line, you know. All the girls were beautiful. I was young, but I, I knew beauty, even at that age. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, of course, I was working when I wasn't supposed to be working, because I was underage. But being that uh, everything was run by the by the mob in those days, you know, you know. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't bother me. <laughs> you to play in Vegas or is this? Oh yeah, always sure. Yeah. This working period is just... Uh, 
Are you nervous at all? Uh, no. Uh, just a no. Okay. Just, yeah, as they say. Yeah. I, I used to get very nervous. I get nervous I get sick. When I was younger, much younger. <laughs> <laughs>
happen to be dead or died somewhere along the way is wrong. <laughs> because um, there's the big film thing in the 30s. Everybody knows that. Fred and Ginger and Eleanor. But like in the 40s when Bebop came in and the drummers started getting outrageous, there were so many tap dancers that could keep up with that. And there were tap dancers that kept up with that. And those were the jazz tap percussionists. And that's like, those are my heroes, and that's where I really draw from. And those are people that could keep up with Dizzy Gillespie and Miles and all these people that were playing outrageous music and going outside and back and outside and back. And people like Baby Lawrence, who had been a jazz singer, could, like, keep up with that speed and complexity of bebop. Also, uh, he, you know, he could sing the melody with his taps. It was incredible. And he was an incredible ad lib dancer, and you had to be. And so anyway, all this was happening in the 40s, and it's not recorded. And if you weren't in these very small places in Harlem, you might think that tap was dead during this time, but these people were moving. And like, maybe 70s, they started asking them to the jazz festival, like the Monterey Jazz Festival. And then it was just, oh, this is great, when all along they've been working and struggling all that time. And uh, for me, when I see that history, I don't see any time when it died. It's just whether you were in tune to it. And of course, Hollywood was so restricted for these great artists that the majority of the country has no idea they exist. They know Bill Robinson. And maybe a few people have seen Stormy Weather, know the Nicholas Brothers, but few people know Chuck Green or Baby Lawrence or Honey Cole, any of those people, because they just didn't make it into the film. Honey was in town with Bubbling Brown Sugar in San Francisco, and uh, when I found that out, blew my mind. It was great. I read about him. He was with uh, Colson Atkins, which is uh, a duo, and they were well known for doing the slowest soft shoe ever, and which is an incredible thing. To dance fast is difficult, but to dance very slow takes an incredible amount of finesse and control. And uh, so I went backstage and said, I'm a tap percussionist. Can you come over? And he said, I'll be there tomorrow. So he came over, and we we did a lot of different things. Uh, I was very nervous, of course. Here's Honey Cole. Because, well, show me a time step. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> and so when Honey saw how I worked, we were friends. Because, you know, instead of working high, like this, you know, I already knew how to use my heels some. And his hero is. John Bubbles, who was the one who brought the heels in. singing and we also did some very good dancing. So we were together incidentally 18 years.
many times I've been asked that question, uh, why Coles and Atkins uh, threw in the towel? Sometimes it's very difficult to weather the storm, to come out of it uh, with uh, some desire to remain in it. You know, it's, uh, it's a very cruel business because it's very demanding. And I've, I've forgotten the agent's name, but he booked us every week in the Academy of Music, 14th Street, $35 for the, $35 for the two days, uh, Friday and Saturday. And out of the $35, he took 10%, $350, so we were making a big... But we were glad, we were glad to get it, because at that time, Charlie and I were starving to death, too. The first week we played it, we were Coles and Atkins. The next week we played it, we were John and Joe. The next week we played it, we were Brown and McGraw. But it was a gig, and $35 was $35, you know. Uh, paid your three dollar room rent and so forth. that was probably the slowest soft shoe that ever existed. No, the musicians couldn't believe it, nobody could believe it, but it turned out it was a one-course soft shoe to the tune of Taking a Chance on Love, which Ethel Waters inspired us to use this song, because she used to come to our rehearsals and watch. particular date, we had a little three-piece orchestra, and we were playing on the bill with a very, very strong musical. The musical was Bandwagon, with Fred Astaire and uh, Sid Cerise, I think, and uh, the picture was in color, it was such a fabulous movie. And after the picture went off, uh, we came on stage with this little three-piece orchestra. I think the drummer was about 84 years old. And, uh, oh, we were just absolutely horrible. After the audience had sat through this magnificent musical movie, <laughs> then to sit and watch us... always said, you don't have to play the notes as written, play them as you feel. You can stick to the basics such as the melody, but you can improvise off of that. And dancing is similar because you have to feel it to really execute. And uh, rhythm is what it's all about. You got to have rhythm. <laughs> I see. Chuckles and I had gotten established from people remembered us from being Buck and Bubbles Act, and then we got, got out of the act and went for ourselves and developed a name similar, Chuck and Chuckles, that's similar to Buck and Bubbles, you see. And uh, so we made it pretty good. We got up to stardom and uh, Ian Chuckles, he meet this beautiful girl named Alice. 
and uh, he fell in love, and uh, he married, and he wanted to uh, be with her for about two years. So we had an agreement. He said, well, I don't know, we'll lay off for two years, Jay. Yeah, we have you, and you're going to be happy, you see. And uh, so that's what happened, see. up and down Broadway with it. And now it's a hazard. It's like an obstacle course. Everybody's trying to hand you cars to go into porno joints. And, and it was a daily thing to come downtown when the when the subway fare was a nickel. You'd come downtown and you hustle around, you go to all of the different offices every day trying to get gigs. I think I'd have made it big in film. I, I, I think I would have had the same opportunity as, 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 as Anna Stair or Gene Kelly or Lee Dixon or any of the guys at that period. Uh, opportunities just didn't afford themselves, you know. But I think I would have had I been white. I don't know. I may not have even been a dancer if I'd been white. You know. Uh, but I, I think if I had been even the caliber of dancer that I that I became, I think I would have had an excellent opportunity of really being a star in the business. Because I I sing fairly well and uh, I move good, and so I think that that would have that would have been the case. I think I really would have had a chance to make it big. But uh, well, it's conjecture, right? <laughs> was there great segregation between whites and blacks? Oh, yeah. Great, great. The opportunities weren't there. The only one that really made it was Bill Robinson as a dancer. Of course, Buck and Bubbles made it because Buck and Bubbles were a uh, musical comedy act. They worked with Zig Fell Follies. Uh, but they didn't even reach the point, the peak that they should have, you know, because there was no consistency to the work. Whereas you saw a guy, a white, a, a white performer could go from one gig to another, one picture to another. It just didn't happen with blacks. They had to have a particular situation for blacks. Does that angry you? Uh, to a certain extent, yes. You know, it was something that I learned to live with, because you have to learn to live with a lot of things that you're not happy with. And I learned to live with it, but uh, it was a situation that existed. So you just let it alone. Didn't change your outlook on life. No, 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 never, never. I, I, I think the only. 
only time I ever showed any bitterness, I I spent my last money to go on Lowe's State to see a little white dancer named Johnny Downs. And he was so bad, I, I stood up and booed him. That's the only time I really showed any bitterness. You know, and I look at this turkey, and he's, he's a big time star. You know. But that, that's the way it goes. Never really changed anything. Are you still ambitious? No. To make a living, yes. Great heights, no. Is Henny Coles happy? Henny Coles is happy, yes. Satisfied. Let's put it that way. Living a good life. That's about it. Okay. All right. See you. Send a check to my house. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, take care now. Bye-bye.